Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Undergraduate Medicine and Dentistry webinar. We will be starting in a couple of minutes. Just going to let a few people roll in, and uh, we'll get it started. While we let a few people roll in, if uh, if a few students want to put put in the chat box where you're calling in from, we'd love to know where in Canada you're you're in from today. And if for any reason, I just want to also test if the chat box is working for everyone. Amazing, we got Edmonton, Toronto, Brampton. We've got Calgary, Ottawa. Awesome. Perfect. Yes, the recording will be available afterwards. Um, so don't worry about that. If for any reason um, you're not able to take any notes today, uh, we'll definitely be sending the recording to everyone afterwards. All right. So with that, I think I will be starting as we've got a good number of students here today. So hello, everyone. My name is Ashish Tharoor, and I'm the territory one of the territory managers here at Austrek. Um, We're going to be talking about studying in Australia, looking at the undergraduate medicine and dentistry options. We've got a current student at JCU, Parshast, who's going to be talking about his experiences going into the dentistry program. And uh, yeah, so let's get this started. So today we're going to be talking about Austrac, why Australia, looking at the different degrees and universities you have as options, looking at the admissions criteria, um, look, and as well as looking at the key areas of how do you come back after practice, what are your options, as well as getting in touch with us. So firstly, uh, let's talk about Austrac. So Austrac, we are a Canadian company. We're based out of Perth, Ontario. And what we do is we essentially help you with the entire admissions process of getting into programs in Australia. So we like to say that we're there for you from start to finish for free. We help you determine your eligibility and competitiveness to apply. You'd be talking to one of our dedicated admissions people um, and essentially going through all the requirements, making sure that you are competitive, looking at the prerequisites and all of that. And then once you essentially are determined to be eligible and competitive to apply, we would choose all the universities you're able to, part, uh, to apply to and apply all at once for you. Uh, we also certify transcripts and submit your apps to the universities here in Canada, so making it as easy as possible. And we like to say that we assess and advocate for each student's needs, making sure that everything you need is taken care of, representing you accurately with the universities, as well as making sure that all those gray areas, all those questions are answered for you. And finally, we help you accept and get ready to go. So essentially, we would help you accept that offer, get your visa sorted, accommodation, housing, everything like that. And then we do a pre-departure event uh, before you embark on your journey where you're able to meet with other students that are about to embark on this journey as well. 
So the other thing that we also talk about is understanding licensing. So looking at um, how do you come back for um, med license, medical residency here in Canada, as well as looking at for dentistry, what is the guidelines from the National Dentistry Examinary Board and things like that. We do a ton of in-person as well as online sessions on this. So if you keep in touch with us and look out for some emails, every uh, few months we do these medical licensing webinars where we will send you an invite as well. How does the ap application process look for medicine as well as dentistry in a lot of ways? It's essentially, you would connect with Austrek, you'd connect with our dedicated admissions uh, team. So we have a dedicated admissions team for dentistry and then for medicine as well. Uh, so you'd ask us all your questions, figure out whether medicine or dentistry is the right program for you. Uh, once we find that program that fits, we would apply online and essentially do the entire application process for you. Uh, the next step after that would be to attend the interview, depending on the program and university you're applying to. And then finally, accept that offer. Hopefully, if it comes in, we would show you things like how do you pay the deposit? How do you secure that spot? And finally, work on the pre-departure and liftoff, uh, which is essentially um, you'll receive guidance about financing, accommodation, student visas, and much more. So this is a beautiful picture of Melbourne and Yarra River. I always say that um, Australia is definitely a very eye-catching and mesmerizing place for many people. And a lot of students end up falling in love with the country and the place that they chose. So about Australia and uh, looking at uh, the different options that they have. So the idea is, is that Australia is a 23 million diverse population. They have a similar size to Canada for healthcare, education, legal system. It's English speaking, ranks in most livable cities in the world. It's got an amazing climate. While you look at Toronto right now at uh, one degree, it definitely is a much better climate down under. Medical schools have prestigious global reputation and the same goes for dentistry as well. While looking at the idea of why do you study in Australia, what, what, is, what makes it so attractive? It's the idea of looking at the fact that there are limited places at Canadian universities for dentistry and medicine. Um, you're going to world ranked universities in Australia that kind of in a lot of ways are at par with Toronto universities or sorry, Canadian universities as a whole. Um, they like to boast that they have student support, hands-on approaches with all the programs that they do. Um, you're definitely not going to be missing out or uh, in a classroom size where you're not able to be in touch with your professor or guidance. Uh, beautiful climate, beaches, cities, adventurous outdoor lifestyle. We like to say that um, these are the many reasons that people like to study in Australia because it's not only about the education, but also about the overall experience of leaving your home and uh, going to a country that you really would fall in love with. Uh, and uh, many students in Austrek, uh, we've kind of seen over the years, travel across Australia, go to various different areas. This is Sydney, and in general, show you the different uh, the, uh, different kind of adventures that they have. And I'm sure Parshas, even though he's in first year, must have done some fun things, or maybe he'll talk about his experience a little more later. So to start us off, I'm going to be talking about medical schools in Australia and the uh, in specific looking at the undergraduate options. When you look at the undergraduate options, this is a geographical map of Australia and the undergraduate schools that we have that offer programs directly from a high school. So you've got six undergraduate options for students applying directly from high school. Um, and essentially the idea is, is that it would give you an equivalent degree to the MD. Um, now, when you're looking at the different universities, these are the different universities that you have. You've got Flinders, Griffith, James Cook University, Macquarie, Monash, and University of Western Australia. Um, Flinders, Griffith, and Macquarie have a two plus four. So essentially, you'd be doing two years of an undergrad and then going into the MD. Um, JCU and Monash are going to be a six and a five year direct going into entire single doctorate degree and University of Western Australia would be a three plus three. So essentially three years of undergrad and then three years of your MD degree. 
Looking at um, the eligibility intake for 2023, we had 180 direct entry apps submitted and 71 offers received. Um, from the grade 12 subjects, it was looking at the best four to six, and the competitive GPA that got students in was a 94% average. When looking at the medical school rankings, as I mentioned before, you can see over here the different universities as well as how they rank compared to Canada. Now, it's the the idea is, is that we want to show you that you're not going to a country where you're missing out on reputation, on prestige. Uh, the universities in Australia have um, the utmost respect all across the world. And the idea is, is that the rankings that you see in Canada and Australia are quite at par. Now, looking at the medicine, um, kind of the deep dive overall outlook of it is um, the duration is going to be five to six years. Minimum averages range from 86% to 95% from the top five to six, um, all grade 12 courses. If you're in IB, the International Baccalaureate, you're looking at having an overall score of 35 to 42. And now this definitely varies by university. So it's important to look at the specific university requirements as well on our website. Uh, prerequisites, English, math, and chemistry at grade 12 equivalent or greater. Um, again, these are things that our uh, admissions team will take care of and make sure that you meet these prerequisites. So don't worry too much if maybe you don't have one, maybe there is a way of uh, making sure that you can cover that prerequisite if you've not taken it in high school. Interviews are typically in person in Canada or via video conference. After COVID, we've definitely seen more of a shift towards um, video conferences, uh, as well as the additional requirements that you would see for students applying straight from high school is the ISAT, um, as well as a supplemental application for JCU. This essentially would be an application which uh, would show your interest towards JCU and as well as Indigenous peoples. So fast facts for undergraduate entry uh, for medicine. So again, it's a six year, two plus four or three plus three GPA requirement, 86% admissions tests. Uh, you would need ISAT for only two of the programs. The number of international places that these universities have range from 13 to 70 seats per university. The interviews, as I said, are mostly online now. Um, and when to apply, this is an important question that we always get. Uh, keep in mind that the academic year in Australia is flipped. The idea is, is that uh, Australia follows the calendar year. And with that, uh, the academic year would start at the end of January. So you would typically see yourself applying a year before. Uh, so that would be in your final semester of your high school um, high school experience, you would be getting in touch with Austrac, getting that application sorted, and we would typically start getting your applications in towards uh, the beginning of April to end of May. Programs start the end of Jan to February, and you're looking at an undergraduate tuition of $35,000 to $87,000 Australian dollars. Uh, it ranges by university as well as the tuition fee will range um, between your undergraduate years and your MD years. Uh, these are things that I've already talked about, so I'm definitely going to quickly skip over it. Uh, the idea is, is that we want you to make sure that you have a competitive um, GPA. Austrec do, does set competitive requirements for these programs. So the undergraduate program can ha be highly competitive and closer to mid 90s is considered competitive for most of the programs as well as dentistry. Um, so if you are in the mid 90s, you are a competitive applicant that's able to apply and we would definitely um, see, see you get an offer at some of the universities. ISAT is required by Monash and University of Western Australia and the prerequisites again for grade 12, English, Chem and Math. So when looking at the ISAT scores, uh, this is something that a lot of students kind of see and go, what is the ISAT score that I need? Um, you should be aiming for an overall 180. Uh, the minimum ISAT score for Monash is a 170 plus, And then for University of Western Australia is making sure that you meet the 25 percentile in each section. But at Austrac, what we say is if you aim for a 180 and above, you are a competitive applicant and you're able to possibly get an offer. 
As you can see on the right, uh, the competitive GPA for 2023, these are the percentage averages that got students in to each of the universities. So for Flinders, it was a 96% average. For Griffith, it was an 88% average. JCU, 95. And it goes on to 95 up until University of Western Australia, which is a 90%. So, uh, so the idea is, is even though the minimum can be around 86 percent, um, there definitely is a lot of competition with going straight from high school. So having yourself at a little bit of a higher GPA will definitely keep you competitive. And Austrac definitely looks at all the years and makes sure that we keep a cumulative competitive score for you to achieve. Now, the, the, the question that I always get asked is about how do you come back after you finish a medical degree? So you have four options. I'm not going to be going into the, the details of each one because it definitely is a webinar of its own that we do. And um, we would love to go into details when it comes to it. So I'm going to show you the four options that you have. You have the option to return to Canada after uh, you finish the MD portion of your degree. You can come back and match with the resident system here in Canada and um, choose a specialization that you would be going into. The second option is you complete your postgraduate training in Australia and you return back to Canada as a doctor. Now the idea is is that there are specific barriers in place for that like for example you potentially may have to do a few months in residency again you would have to get approval from a specific department at a hospital and you potentially would have to do the licensing exam again. But uh, there will be more details that we go through in the webinar. So highly recommend that uh, you keep in touch with us to get information on that. Now, our most popular option is to stay in Australia to complete your internship and practice as a doctor there. Most students end up choosing this option because of the idea that after you're finished with five to six years of your degree, you would have seen yourself settle there, potentially meet someone. Or the idea is, is that you fall in love with the country. So uh, a large number of our students end up choosing to stay in Australia because of this. And typically we see students after a few years then explore their options of potentially returning to Canada or even going to the US, which is your fourth option. And that is to do your MLE exams in the US and start practicing there. Once you finish your residency in the US, you also have a pretty easy and streamlined way of getting back into Canada afterwards. Uh, so there are pretty um, strong options for you here. And that's what we like to say. You've got four strong options that you have. And we definitely hope that one of these options would work successfully for you. Now, looking at dental schools in Australia and the different options that you have. So in Australia, you've got nine dental schools that Austrac represents. Uh, you've got James Cook University, University of Queensland, Griffith, Charles Strutt, La Trobe, and University of Western Australia. Um, now, out of that, six are undergraduate options for students applying directly from high school. And these are the, uh, the different options that you have. So with Charles Strutt, you've got the Bachelor of Dental Science. With Griffith University, you've got the Bachelor of Dental Health Science and the Master of Dentistry. Um, at JC, you've got the Bachelor of Dental Surgery. U University of Queensland, you've got the Bachelor of Dental Science. Western Australia, you've got the Bachelor of Biomedicine Specialized and then the Doctor of Dental Medicine. And at La Trobe University, you've got the Bachelor of Dental Science. So each program and each university has a different way of offering you at the, at the end of the day, the same equivalency. So uh, the idea is about doing research about these each, uh, each of these universities speaking with our admissions team to see what makes them unique, what makes them attractive to students, and choosing potentially maybe the top three that you would apply to, or potentially applying to all of them. Now, looking at the, uh, the eligibility intakes for 2023 for undergraduate dentistry, so we had 920, 20, 922 apps submitted, um, 103 offers received. The prerequisites were English, math, chemistry, and bio. Um, a competitive average of 94% is what got students in. Uh, in a kind of a snapshot of looking at everything together, the duration of a dental uh, degree straight from high school is five years. The minimum average it ranges from 83% to 94% uh, from the top five to six grade 12 courses. If you're doing the IB, it's going to be a 35 to 42 uh, is what gets you in. 
The prerequisites um, varies by universities, but overall you're going to see the prerequisites be English, math, and chemistry at grade 12, um, course equivalent or greater. Interviews, if applicable, either in person or via video conference. Um, again, as I mentioned before, you're going to see more of it be online now. Um, and the additional requirements that dentistry degrees require is the UCAT, and it is the Australian and New Zealand version uh, for University of Queensland. Um, and then for University of Western Australia, it would be the ISAT. And then for JCU, they require the supplemental application as well. Uh, yeah. And then looking at fast facts for undergraduate entry. So you've got five years. It's a three plus three. Um, the GPA requirements is a 83% minimum, but the competitive is a 94% average is what gets you in. The admissions test that gets you into uh, University of Queensland, as well as uh, UWA is the ISAT and the Australia, New Zealand, UCAT. The number of international places that uh, universities have to offer ranges from 10 to 40 seats per, per university. Interviews, as I mentioned, are online. When to apply, it's the same as medicine. So you're looking at January to May the year before as being the timeline of when applications would be submitted by us for you. Uh, programs would start in February. And the undergraduate tuition is going to range from 62,000 to 77,500 Australian dollars. This was updated as of 2023. So now to move on to the competitive scores uh, for the undergraduate entry. So you can see for the different universities, the average GPA that got them in. So it was essentially a 95%, 97, essentially ranges from the idea that you, you would hope to be at a 90 and above to be able to be competitive at these universities. Latrobe was at a high 98%, but keep in mind that they have limited seats and that's why it's quite competitive to get in. Um, you can also see the international places on the right that uh, each of these universities have to offer. And look at the, what do the universities consider? So you can see that most of them, uh, or all of them will require the GPA and some of them will have the supplementary, the UCAT and the ISAT and UWA requires an interview. Um, if you're applying straight from university to these programs, these are the GPAs that you'd be looking at. And as, uh, uh, as you are applying directly from high school, no DAT would be required. And now to discuss the idea of how do you come back home for dentistry, it's a lot more streamlined compared to uh, compared to uh, medicine in that way, where essentially the Commission of Dental Accreditation of Canada has a mutual recognition with the Australian Dental Council since 2010. So the idea is, is that you have no additional exams when you come back to Canada. You would essentially be writing the same NDEB exams and OSCE examinations that a domestic graduate would have done. So there's no bridging programs or exams required. Um, you typically would be doing exactly what what a domestic student that went to a dental school in Canada uh, would be doing to start their practice. So no, nothing else required. The idea is, is that dentistry with this mutual agreement keeps it quite streamlined and easy to come back. And that's what makes it quite attractive for a lot of students to be considering dentistry as an option. So I've talked about a lot in these um, in these past 20 minutes that I've had. And the idea is, is that there's always going to be more information. And the last thing that I will be talking about is financing. So uh, you have four options here that we at Allstrike show you. And that is that the first is that you're able to get student loans. So student loans essentially are from OSA, from BC Student Aid, uh, from Alberta Student Aid. Depending on the province that you are at, you are able to apply for um, different student loans. Uh, but unfortunately, they are capped at a certain amount. So the idea is, is that you would potentially get a student loan and club that with a professional line of credit with the bank. These would be the big banks, CIBC, RBC. Um, and the idea is, is that a professional line of credit can give you up to $400,000. Um, the third option is to definitely look at personal and family savings to support you. Um, uh, we hope that with the three of these, the student loans, the professional line of credit and family support, um, you're able to cover the entire 
journey as well as your living expenses and everything that you would possibly have. Uh, the, uh, the idea of having scholarships is quite rare. Um, while some of the universities do definitely offer it and we will show you those options when you get in touch with our admissions team, uh, we don't want to get your hopes up because it's very rare and the idea is, is that everyone from across the world will be applying for these uh, scholarships as well. You can also see the currency conversion from CAD to Australian dollars as of November 2023. Um, so the, the Canadian dollar is slightly stronger than the Australian dollar, but it's give or take. Uh, so these are the student loan um, amounts that you're able to get from the government and provincial. So essentially for Ontario, it's capped at $10,000 a year. British Columbia is capped at $25,000 a year. And uh, Alberta's uh, student aid is, ca is capped at $30,000 a year. So if you calculate all of these along with your professional line of credit or personal savings or your family support, a lot of students have been able to successfully cover everything and essentially um, essentially successfully come back to Canada or start their practice in Australia and pay off their uh, finances. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to now hand it over to Parshast, who is our uh, student uh, from JCU. He is in his first year, and I'm going to allow him to introduce himself and talk about his experience. Thank you, Parshast, for being here. Thank you, uh, Shish, for introducing me. Hi, everyone. I'm Parshast. I'm a first year dentistry student at JCU. I actually just finished my first year, and I'm back in Canada now. And so I applied directly from high school. Uh, I'm from Ontario, and so yes, I started my application process with Austrek in around January 2022, um, got all my applications, and I applied to every university. I feel like that's the easiest thing to do, just apply everywhere, see where you get in. It does, however, make it a little bit more difficult when you're choosing, but it's a lot better to have more choice of universities rather than kind of put all of your hope, put all your eggs in one basket, let's say. So yeah, I applied to every university I could. I like JCU personally because I know um, some people from my own high school who went there and they really loved the program. Um, they also, uh, they graduated a couple years before I applied. And JCU also compared to, I think the other universities, they offer a lot more clinical hours, which is one of the biggest selling points for me at least. And so, yeah, finished my first year at JCU. I get my results next week. So hopefully all went well. Yeah. If you guys have any questions, fire away. Perfect. Thank you, Parsha. So I, um, what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to a q and A. I I already see some questions here. And instead of typing it out, I will be answering it uh, live. As well as, Parsha, if there's any uh, questions for you, I will ask you as well. Yes. So, sure. Uh, what I see over here is um, a first, one of the first questions is how does Austrek do all of this for free? What is the catch? The idea is, is that we're funded by uh, the Australian universities. We're partnered with 15 schools over there. And uh, what we do is um, since we are funded with them, we like to keep the services free for students, as well as application fees to most of the universities are waived when you apply through us. Uh, now the next one, how much choice do we have over which university we go to? So the choice is completely up to you. When you get in touch with our admissions team, like Parshas did a few years back, or um, a, not to a few years, maybe like two years back. Yeah. And uh, the idea is, is that you would be talking about your interests, talking about the program that you want to do, and then you would hope hopefully shortlist a couple of universities that you want to apply to and then we would submit those applications for you get you into the program and then um the once you get those admissions offers you would have the choice to then choose which one you would accept and secure is this also an option for undergraduate students already working on their bachelor's degrees in Canada? Unfortunately not. There are two universities that you are able to for medicine, um, but the idea is for dentistry, you definitely are, but for medicine, there's only two universities um, that's allowed. For IB, a final score of 40 and above is highly difficult. Would the final admissions be based on the predicted score or the final score? 
Great question. So the idea is, is that we would be applying with your provisional results uh, because of the fact that the applications would be required um, before your final IB results come out, but uh, you will receive a conditional offer based on your uh, final IB results. Um, how about students with a high 80% average? So uh, what we do at Allstruck is we would definitely take in your grades and take in your averages and see your chances of getting in. We keep it transparent and we'd like to show you the different ways that um, you can look at the different options. So if you see how about like if you're if you're at an 80 percent or a high 80 percent the idea is is that we would still try and get you to apply but if you if you look at the competitive grades that have got students in the chances would be a little lower is the webinar being recorded the webinar is being recorded and we'll definitely be sending it out to students i'm just going to quickly see if there's any questions here for parshas or well, Parshas, I'm going to ask you a question real quick, if you don't yeah. mind. Would you mind touching on your day daily life as a dental student? What uh, what does it look like as a first year and what should students be accept, uh, expecting? Daily life as a dental student. So actually, I did a semester at the University of Guelph before going to Australia. I heard that I, I got accepted into JCU in September and I already had gotten accepted to Guelph. And I was I think it was the day before I moved in that I got my acceptance from JCU. So I still went and did a semester and comparing like kind of high school and university here to dentistry in Australia, first year at least is pretty similar. There's not a huge workload. I think I had two or three labs a week. Um, we used to have one sim clinic session as well where we actually get to practice drilling in the mannequins. And then you can expect like five or six lectures a week in JCU. Um, we only have one major class, which is called dental science, which you have all of your subjects in like anatomy, biology, chemistry, all of that is covered there. So on a regular day, I'd probably get up in the morning, go to classes, like lectures from nine to 12. And on my busy days, I'll have another lab from one to four. Then I'll come back. I'll study for a little bit before dinner and then study for like maybe an hour afterwards and then kind of relax, hang out with my friends. Because the residents we lived at, there were a bunch of international students and other dentistry students. So we just, at night, we just hang out, hang around, talk. That's it. Not a whole lot of work in first year. That's great. And how was your uh, time settling into Australia? Was it hard? Uh, how was your experience in general? Honestly, the biggest kind of shock was the temperature. Other than that, Austrek puts you in touch with other international students from your program. So I started talking to a couple of people while I was still in Canada. And when I got there, one of those guys is actually my roommate now. Huh? And so we practically did everything together. We got oh, we got to Australia. We got all of our like licenses and did CPR and stuff together. So what settling in is, it seems like a lot, but if you have a friend or someone that you get to know, um, beforehand doing it, then it's a lot, lot easier. Perfect. And Parshas, um, there was a student here that asked, did you do the IB? What was the curriculum that you did in high school that got you into the university? I did not do IB because my school didn't offer it. I'm from a smaller town about two and a half hours north of Toronto. So I just did like a regular Ontario secondary school diploma. And I also wrote the UCAT as well for the University of Queensland. So those are the two, those are the only two things I did. And how was your experience during the UCAT for the UCAT, University of Queensland? Well, it's an interesting test. It's definitely not like any other test I've written before. I highly recommend getting some practice test books or doing like online practice question banks, things like that for it. Because honestly, the more questions you do, the more feel you get for what kind of things can be asked and the better you'll do on the actual day. Thanks for that. Yeah, definitely. It's one of those where we've heard students say that you should prep for it, do some practice questions, yeah. question banks. Uh, we definitely show you resources and um, uh, Austria can connect you with uh, tutors and things like that that can help you prep for this as well. 
Um, I have a, a question here that I'm going to answer real quick. So will students after graduating medicine have to take a test again to return to Canada? So the idea is, is that you will have to do a licensing exam when you come back. So that's the MCCE exam. And uh, to be able to even qualify for that, you would have to do the OSCE exam, which, in, which is essentially an exam that you do while you're in your final year of your medical degree, you would come back to Canada, you would do it. It's an exam that every international student coming to Canada has to write. Once you finish both those exams, you're able to then apply for your residency. Perfect. Uh, looking at here, the... Are there courses to prepare for the ISAT? There definitely is. Uh, Parshas, were you by any chance able to do the ISAT or do you have any? I components? was not. I don't think I did not apply to the University of Western Australia, so I did not do the ISAT. And I honestly had not heard of it before today. Okay. So it's completely new to me. <laughs> definitely. So the ISAT is um, an exam that uh, students are required to do for some of the universities. And the way it works, um, if anyone is wondering, I do see some here that what is ISAT? So ISAT is essentially a situational judgment test. You're going to be doing a standardized test that helps the universities understand who you are as an individual. The idea is, is that you're not giving any essays, you're not giving any resumes or anything like that for them to understand your personality. So the ISAT kind of gives them an idea of you. And um, the the goal is, is that with the ISAT, you also get, have all the knowledge needed to be get, getting into a dental program or a medical program. Um, are students able to work while in school or over the summer, or do they need to have a different visa to do so? I know the answer to this, but Parshas, have you had any experience with this while you've been there right now? Honestly, I'm pretty sure you can work if you want to, but out of all of the international students that I know and that my friends know at JCU and at other universities, I don't think any of them have chosen to work just because like in first year, yes, the workload isn't that much, but you're also getting settled into a completely new place, meeting new people. And that in itself is like very time consuming. And then in second year, second year, a lot of people say is the hardest year. So a lot of people don't get into work then either. And then at JCU, at least third and fourth year, you start in clinic. So out of all of the international students I know, I don't think any of them have chosen to work. <laughs> That's great to know. Yeah. And um, and it's definitely one of those things where uh, um, students should keep in mind that when you go there and you do work, um, we definitely don't want to encourage the idea that you work a lot and you take away from your education. But a lot of students do kind of cover their living costs with working there. Uh, minimum wage is significantly higher than here in Canada. Um, I believe it can range from around twenty five to twenty eight dollars an hour. And uh, just depending on the, the area that you're in in Australia, and you can typically see a student be able to cover a significant amount of their um, living expenses with securing a minimum wage job over there. Uh, now, looking at how do you uh, is it too late to apply if you're in grade 12? Well, if you're in grade 12 right now and um, you are pro possibly going into your final semester in January, uh, the idea is, is that you're not too late. You're at the perfect time. Um, you would get in touch with us in January or even now uh, if you want to just start the conversation and get the ball rolling, you can. Um, and then we would get everything ready with you uh, for the application intake, which would possibly start around end of March to um, to which closes at the end of May, beginning of June. Uh, Parshas, uh, there's a question here uh, about... How was your, um, what was your GPA like in high school and what, what were kind of the grades that you got that got you into JCU? So my GPA out of the basic classes, personally, I had a 4.0 coming out of high school, but at JCU, a lot of my other friends, I have, um, my roommate, he had a 95 average. Another one of my friends had a 92, I think. I even know students who got in with a, a high 80 at JCU because with JCU it's I think one of the only dentistry schools at least that has the supplementary application and so rather than just looking at your GPA they weight your supplementary application almost equally if not more than your GPA so if you have a really good supplementary application your personality really shines through 
I would say that that's the main thing JCU is looking for. And so even if your GPA is, is not as high, if you have a really good supplementary application, you can get into JCU for sure. Do you mind uh, touching on that supplementary application? Uh, yes. And, and just in general, what were the requirements like? So the main couple questions were, what are um, like the classic, what are your hobbies, extracurriculars, um, favorite kind of things to do? And then I'd say the main question, I think this was the second question, it was um, about indigenous populations and how do you support them and um, how do you kind of, how are you involved with them? And that is a huge question for JCU because um, the university itself is located in like a rural part of Australia. In the clinic, you see a lot of indigenous people so if you have any involvement with, in, with Indigenous communities, that really, really boosts your application. And then the third question is, I think, why do you specifically want to go to JCU? So just go onto the university website, take a look at some of their goals, initiatives, do some research on what JCU is doing, and then sprinkle things like that in um, into that question for the application. And those are the two main questions, I'd say, that you really, really want to get down. Thank you for that. I definitely think that was useful because it's um it's the only university that requires a supplementary uh, essay or application. But in a lot of ways, it's a way of making sure that you can stand out and show who you are as a person. So that's exactly. Cool. Yeah. Um, there's also another question for you here. Uh, so you've got a question that says, are there any non high school um, non high school applicants in your classes? Uh, yes, actually, my other roommate, he did, I think, a year of school at York, and he applied to um, university, he applied to Australian schools after that. And we have one student in my cohort at JCU who applied after doing three years at a university in Calgary. And so but majority of students are high school students. But if you're a university student, don't be discouraged at all, you can still apply and get in for sure. Definitely. Um, I, I think you've already touched to this, but if you have any other points on uh, how is the adjustment from Canada to Australia, is there anything else you want to say? I'd say just stay on top of Austrex kind of list of stuff to do and make sure you take a look at your university's requirements for international students, because I know JCU had like an immunization form, CPR requirement, police check stuff, some stuff you can even get started before you get to Australia. So if you get those things kind of completed, it makes move, um, going there and getting settled in a lot less stressful. That's great. Yeah. And um, and there's another one here that says, how does the cost of living compare to Canada? Does the uh, um, like does the tuition include the residents? How, how has it been adjusting with the finances? So tuition just covers tuition, sadly. Um, if you want to buy any textbooks, I haven't because I um. From what I've heard so far, textbooks aren't super important. And so to um other than tuition, um, cost of living, uh, your residence, food, all of that is separate. So usually I'd say I was at a residence um that kind of included meals along with like my living situation. I was living with two other people, and the cost of that was uh fourteen thousand dollars for the year. And that was including three meals a day and living and laundry and stuff like that. So it is kind of expensive, but compared to tuition, it's maybe it's well, tuition is pretty expensive too. So it does add up. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you for touching on that. It's uh it's it's not a it's it's not a inexpensive degree it's going to be something that you have to plan for and that's why i was touching on the finances earlier um if you have any other questions on finances uh feel free to ask away i'm just going through these questions the best i can i can see a lot of them popping in so please bear with me while i go through them uh so what are the costs to apply so if you're applying to any of the universities in australia or well the 15 that uh, austrac are partnered with uh the application fees are waived so there won't be any cost to apply except for the university of sydney 
is there a limit to how many universities we can apply to? There is no limit to how many universities you can apply to. The idea is, is that uh, our Austrac admissions team would like you to shortlist possibly the top three or the top four that you would want to get into. And we would focus on those applications mainly. However, we are flexible and we will make sure that we can apply to any of the universities that you want to. Um, what are my chances if my best six average is around a 95 to 96 as a BC student? So chances are very good. Um, you've got a you've got a good good standing over there. And as you could see in our competitive GPA requirements, um, if you have anything above a 90 to a 94 percent average, you will essentially be having a strong chance of being able to get into um, get into school. So you have a question here, Parshas. How do you keep up in dental school? Is time management difficult? It Coming straight out of high school, I don't think it was that difficult because I also had the semester of Guelph, so I didn't really fall out of the rhythm. But a lot of my friends who would kind of, after their final semester of high school, I think they um, worked at a dental clinic or they just kind of relaxed at home or worked somewhere else they had a bit of a um, more difficult time adjusting to the time management. But even still, within the first couple of months, you really get a schedule going and then you know exactly what to do, when to do it. And then so adjusting itself, it takes a while, but once once it happens, once you do it, um, things kind of just flow from there. Definitely. That's great. Um, and uh, for Parshas, are you planning on returning to Canada to work? For now, yes, I definitely am. Even though the Australian weather is great, you can go to the beach 24-7. My heart still is with the snow. I do love it here. So yes, I am planning on coming back after my five years. That's great. Yes, definitely want to see more of you come back. That would be awesome. <laughs> um, now, looking at, do we stay in Australia between each year? If not, if not required, are we still able to? You are definitely able to stay back in Australia between each year. Um, it depends on you. Like Parshas has now decided to come back and uh, visit his family for his break. But it's totally up to you on um, what, uh, what you would like to do. You will be having a student visa for the entire duration of the program. And then afterwards, you would be able to apply for a, a work permit after you are done with your degree and then should you be serious about kind of settling in Australia then you can look at the options of a PR and things like that. Uh, are extracurriculars taken into account when uh, when one of the universities is considering a student? So that's a great question. No, the idea is, is and I see a couple of questions about this, the idea is is that all the universities, except for JCU in a lot of ways, is very grades focused. Um, the idea, the, the reason for that is you are being considered as an international applicant and there are going to be applicants from all over the world applying. Now, when students from all across the world are applying to give equal opportunity, the most kind of basic metric that universities can use to gauge a student's um, abilities is through grades. So that's why they have the GPA requirement. That's why some of the universities are requiring the ISAT or the UCAT and JCU. Because JCU has a very close place to the indigenous practices and the idea of being in a rural area of Australia, they want to make sure that they have the right students coming to their university. So that's why they have that supplemental application. And that's what Parsha said, touched on a little earlier. Um, Parsha, I wanted to ask you if, um, uh, when you were applying, was there, when did you receive your offer as well as what was the reason for doing uh, a semester at Guelph? Because I think a lot of students would have this dilemma as well. Yeah, for me, I had applied, um, I had finished all my applications and gotten them in as soon as I could with Austrac because I think um, there was, um, I guess, something saying that JCU usually um, gives like rolling admissions. So the sooner you apply, the sooner you'll get an offer. Uh, that, I don't know if it's just for domestic students, but I don't think that's the case for us, at least, because I got my um, offers. I, I started getting my offers from September. September 1st, my first offer came. And then so after that, within the first two weeks of September, I had gotten all the offers I was going to get. And so that's for that part. And why I chose to do a semester at Guelph, 
I personally, it was for the time management reason. I did not want to fall out of my rhythm of going to school. And a lot of my friends from high school here were going to Guelph. So I thought I'd join them, hang out with them for another four months and kind of get used to um, staying away from home and give my parents some, uh, some time to adjust as well from not having me around constantly. So it was kind of like a little leap before the big jump about moving across the world. Definitely. We see a lot of students do that as an option. And I, I can now, after you've spoken about it, see the value of time management being a key thing there, um, you know, not getting out of that rhythm um, and uh, making sure that you're still kind of focused and dialed in to be able to uh, start that degree. So that's great. Um, so yes, keep in mind uh, that offers do roll in towards the end of August, or it's sometimes even beginning of August, but typically some of the universities would have their offers roll in the first few weeks of September. So with that being said, a lot of students sometimes are a bit unsure about what they want to do because you would typically have already received your Canadian university offers at that time to go into an undergraduate degree. You would have typically had that in um, probably even before you were done with your high school degree. Um, so a lot of students uh, try to maybe start their undergraduate degree, maybe do a semester to keep in the rhythm or you can also just wait for the offer, maybe take a gap semester and then start in Canada um, in January or you'd be starting in Australia in January as well. Um, so there are options for you, but keep in mind that the offers, as I saw a few questions here, ask when did the offers come out? Um, you would typically see it come out uh, towards the end of summer. So what is the difference between the Australian and Canadian high school curriculum, do students from Canada struggle academically in these programs? From what I've seen, no, not at all. Uh, in fact, a lot of the international students that I know are amongst like the top people in my program, at least at JCU and dentistry. And so the Australian high school system, the curriculum, I'm I think it's very similar. Um, from what I've heard, it's very similar to the schooling system in Canada. So there isn't really a big jump or a big kind of um, pile of stuff you don't know, even when you get into a program that goes directly into like graduate dentistry. Definitely. And I would definitely say it's likewise for medical students as well. Um, you could see this, uh, see um, a lot of Canadian students go directly into the medical programs in Australia and they kind of have a seamless entry into it, and which is great to see always. Uh, it's also important to address the idea that Due to the fact that um, the idea that the Australian Dental Board and the Canadian Dental Board have an agreement is because of the, the understanding that curriculums in these universities as well are quite similar. So you're not too far off from a Canadian dental degree when you're going to Australia and um, you're not learning anything different from what you would be learning here uh, if you go to Australia. So that's important to keep in mind um, while you look at different options. So uh, does an Australian Canadian citizen living and studying in Canada have an advantage in admissions or discounted fees in Australian universities? Great question. Um, so the idea is, is if you are an Australian citizen living and studying in Canada right now, um, your admissions requirements are going to be different to what I spoke about today. They, they definitely won't be too different in the sense of it's still very competitive, um, but they are very different in terms of you would be going through a domestic admissions team at the universities. Unfortunately, Austrac is not allowed to help Australian citizens. We are dedicated and um, fully serviced to be helping Canadian students applying to uh, universities in Australia. To answer your question about discounted fees, you will be paying a domestic fees uh, at these Australian universities, which is going to be significantly lesser than an international fees at these universities. Um, there's a question here, Parshas, um, if you don't mind answering, which is what is the average monthly spend that you would have uh, in this first year of university? Average monthly spend. So based on, I decided to, for my residence fees, I paid it all up front, but a lot of my friends chose to kind of do a bi-weekly split. So they'd pay for my residence, at least, I think it was $700 uh, every two weeks. So $1,400 a month. And then on top of that, if you want to get snacks and stuff, things like that. Other than that, um, 
like phone plan that's a, um that's something that i would definitely find when you get back there's a lot of um the universities even provide like student discounts and like you have phone companies showing up to the university like giving student discounts and things like that but other than that i don't think that there's much more of a monthly spend so i'd say on top of rent and getting snacks maybe the maximum you could look at is like two thousand dollars and that's like really really stretching it And is uh, is JCU a residence throughout the degree or will you be staying off campus next year? so for jcu um there is an on-campus residence uh mainly for students who are applying in um for first year And then I, after my first year, I'm moving off campus with two of my friends to a place called The Beaches, which is an apartment complex close to the university. And then um, other than that, in JCU, at least in JCU and Cairns, where I am, uh, other than those two places, there are just a bunch of other places that you can rent if you want to. But other than that, yeah, no real university residents other than the one on campus. Yeah, and I would say that's probably likewise for all the other universities as well, um, whether you're in the dent or med program. Um, so keep that in mind while you're prepping to get there. Uh, now there's a question here that I will be answering. How do universities qualify students to get into the medical program in year three or year four? Um, uh, year four. So yeah, the two plus four or three plus three years programs respectively. Great question. So the idea is, is that to qualify to get into the MD aspect of these degrees, most of the universities would have qualified you when you applied. So uh, you would not need to have any kind of additional applicant uh, application or anything submitted to get into the latter part of the program. There will be a minimum GPA that you would have to keep, which is essentially around a 70% average. So if you have a 70% average, you're able to continue on to the MD aspect and then uh, move on from there. Uh, and this would be kind of the case for most of the universities that you would see. Some of them uh, don't have anything at all, but if they do, it would be the 70% average. Uh, would it be okay if you do the MCAT? Will the universities translate your MCAT score into a UCAT curriculum? Unfortunately not. Um, and there was also another question about would the UCAT help you with other universities as well? So the universities have very strict requirements and the way that they work is that they do not look at other tests that you've done because uh, they have specific metrics and rankings that they do for each applicant. So if you've done UCAT for University of Queensland, that will not help you with your application to JCU, or it wouldn't help your application to Griffith, for example. And the same goes for MCAT. So MCAT, um, MCAT is used for students that are applying directly from, uh, sorry, not directly, but after your undergraduate degree, going straight into the MD program. Um, so that is something that you do not require, you, you're not required to do. And they would only look at the UCAT for University of Queensland. Um, I believe uh, you've already touched on the supplementary applications. I'm going to skip that one. Uh, what kind of extracurricular activities are required for admissions to med schools? Uh, once again, it's very grades focused and the only uh, university that requires some sort of um, extra application uh, would be JCU for med and dent where um, you would be where you would be talking about that. Uh, what if I want to take a year off and travel? Can I still apply after this? Absolutely, you can. Um, you can definitely apply. You can take a gap year if you'd like um, and uh, then apply. But the idea is, is that if you do get an offer, you aren't able to defer and take a gap year and then come back. You would need to apply all over again if you would like to take that gap year. Uh, if you apply from university, what marks do they look at? So when you're looking at getting into the MD program, you're looking at uh, um, needing MD as well as the DDS program. You're looking at essentially needing around a 3.0 to 3.5 GPA at university to be able to be competitive to get into these programs. Their minimum GPA requirement is a 2.7. So that's a 70% average. Uh, but then once you look at the competitiveness, it's around an 80 to 85 percent average that gets you in a lot of students always ask me why is it 
hard, harder to get in straight from high school, but then it's easier to get in for when you're in university. The the concept and kind of the the understanding that the universities have told us is that they understand that when you're applying from university, you have completed an entire undergraduate degree. You have much more knowledge than a student would possibly have from high school. So they do relax the requirements a little bit, um, as well as since you are an international applicant, they make sure that the requirements are a little more realistic for everyone to be able to apply to. Um, when you're applying from high school, it's very, very competitive. And the idea is, is that not many countries do offer these direct high school entry programs, so which makes the requirements quite high to be able to get in. Um, Parshas, are you planning on doing a specialty after you're done? I honestly don't know yet. I know that a lot of people in their second and third year, when we start getting into doing more specialty stuff like prosthodontics and odontics and get into more surgical aspects of things, a lot of people realize what they want to do then. But for me right now, I'm still just leaning towards general dentistry. Great. That's great. Yeah. And um, a lot of students end up kind of deciding towards the end of their uh, degree, sometimes even afterwards, if they'd mm -hmm. like. Uh, so uh, totally understand that you don't have that answer right now. Um, so confirming, Parshas, your degree is a six year degree, three plus three, correct? Mine is a five year degree, actually. Yeah. I just have it's kind of like four years of actual in school work and then a one year placement afterwards in fifth year. Yeah. And then I think um Griffith might be the three plus three degree because you have like the kind of bachelor's and then the doctor of dental um dental something. Dental surgery, yes. Yeah, doctor. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um now I see a lot of questions here about tuition. So I'm just going to quickly touch on it again. And the ranges that you see for medicine is that um you have a range from forty four thousand dollars a year to $87,000 a year. And you would typically see dentistry be around from the range of $40,000 to $75,000 a year. These are estimates and ranges for each year, depending on the universities. But if you go on our website and specifically look at each university, you can see their tuition cost. And it does get updated every year because the tuitions can change. Does Alberta get the percent boost or is it not recognized? Um, not too sure what, uh, what that is. Um, if you'd like to possibly email me about this afterwards, I can definitely help you out there. Um, so sorry about that. Are you able to pay off your student loans within a few years? Absolutely. We've seen a lot of students be able to do this. Um, uh, the, the idea is, is that you are given a bit of a grace period after you're done um, to be able to get a job, secure your practice, and then be able to pay it off. So we definitely see once they start the process of paying it off, uh, they're able to do it very quickly. Um, are courses taken outside of our high school also considered valid grade 12 courses? Definitely. It depends on where they have been taking and taken. And that's something that I would want you to get in touch with our admissions team to be able to validate and um, certify that it is a course that will be considered. Um... Okay, I'm going to be taking maybe two to three more uh, questions here, and then we're going to call it a night. So Parshas, did you make any Aussie friends? I made lots of Aussie friends in O-Week. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure every university would have an O-Week with a bunch of activities uh, for all students to do. And I know stereotypically people say that Canadians are the nicest people, but Aussies are also super, super nice. And I think there's something that with us come going there with a Canadian accent, they're extra nice to us for some reason. And so, yes, I've made a whole bunch of Australian friends. They're all super nice. And I've met pretty much all of them through my program. Would you, would you definitely say these, you could see you having some lifelong friends in Australia now? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah, that's uh, that's something that we always hear from students. And um, you also see a lot of students kind of uh, finish their degree, they come back to Canada, and now you see them traveling for weddings back in Australia and things like that. So you're definitely going to be seeing a lot of friends, uh, making a lot of friends that uh, are very valuable to you. Um, you have a question here. Why are you choosing to move off residence? Why am I choosing to move off residence? It was just kind of a personal preference between me and my friends. 
Um, the on-campus residents, they're mainly making for first and second years only. And so um, since we're going into second year, we thought I um, might as well get a jump on moving off campus before everyone has to next year. So we kind of got the jump and then we found a place nearby that was good. So we were like, why not? And so we took it. That's great. And uh, uh, the other question you have here, and I think this I'll keep it as, as the last question for you, Parshas, is how many weeks or months do you get off between the years as a dental student at JCU? Uh, we get, so at JCU, you have the um, kind of two mid-semester breaks between each semester, which are a week long. Then you have a week of studying after your semester before your exams start. And then between your two semesters, so in the summer here, I got five weeks off. So from the middle of June till the end of July, I was back home. I was back in Canada. And then now for my um, Canadian winter break, I'm back from kind of the middle of November till the end of January. So two and a half months. And then kind of one more thing that I would want to answer. I saw this question a couple of times is what is the passing rate for the program? And so I don't know about other universities, but for JCU, at least from what I've heard, I think if you get into your program, they really want to keep you. So at least I'd say a minimum of 80, 85% of students who get their pass. And especially if you're an international student, you have a lot on the line, so you work that much harder. So I'd, I'd say pretty much all international students who get into school in Australia, they pass and then they make it through. Definitely. Yeah, that's something that I would definitely say, too, is uh, what we see, especially with the idea, like you said, you have a lot on the line and um, it's a very, very uh, crucial degree for you to complete. And you will you will see that the schools will be very supportive of you, making sure that you do pass, you do get through the entire journey and they don't want to see you not succeed because at the end of the day, it's a reputation for them as well. Um, so there's a question here that I'm going to quickly answer. Australian medical degrees and Caribbean medical degrees will be treated the same in USA to get the residency. Absolutely, that's correct. Um, now, the idea is, is that there would be quotas or kind of seats available for different regions. So um, there, there will be a higher competitiveness for Caribbean students to be able to go to the US because that is typically their only option. Um, but for Australian medical graduates, they have multiple options. So you wouldn't see a lot of students going to the US or Canada because a ma major chunk of them would stay back in Australia. And the few that do end up coming back to Canada or going to the US secure their, um, secure their placement. With the US, another thing to keep in mind with the residency is that their US MLEs, which is the medical licensing exams, are quite different difficult and you only have one try. So it is something that a lot of students prep for from the get-go of their medical degree, making sure that they're mentally prepared for it, um, got all those questions ready and uh, set. So keep that in mind. And we will definitely touch on these topics when you attend one of our medical licensing webinars. Okay. Uh, all right. I think with that, I... I'm going to say for the purpose of time, I'm going to call it an evening. So I'm so sorry for anyone that I've missed your questions or skimmed through it today. It possibly was with the idea that we didn't have time to be able to answer some big questions. Please reach out to me. I'm going to pop my chat in this box over here, and I'm going to be emailing you with the recording as well. So you can get in touch with me at any time. Ask me any questions that you have. We unfortunately were supposed to have a medical student that just graduated from Griffith University, Nadia, join us today as well with Parshas, but unfortunately she wasn't able to make it. I am going to be reaching out to her to see if she's open to having students contact just about general questions about her experience. How was it graduating from a degree straight from high school? And um, she's planning on coming back to Canada. So you can ask her all those questions as well. So we'll definitely try to get that information for you. And if you have any questions or need any support from Austrek, we're going to be there for you from start to finish. Thank you very much and uh, see you all very soon. Thank you. Best so of much, luck, Parshas. everyone. Best of luck for your applications. Yeah. And thank you, Parshas, for being here. It's been great. I think a lot of students got uh, some good answers from you. If you have any final few words, please go ahead. Uh, not just best of luck to make sure that you get your applications in. And then that's mainly it. That's half the battle. Yeah.
That's great. I think I think we're going to see a lot of them uh, get in touch with us. And if there are any questions for you, Parshast, I will ask them to email me and I will get sounds them. Sounds great. Something. That sounds okay. wonderful. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to be stopping the meeting here uh, just for the purposes of recording. And if you need to get in touch, you have my email. Take care, everyone. Have a great night. Thank see you, Ashish. Take care. Night. Bye.